we are Myth Vision. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Your host, Derek Lambert, heretic of heretics. And uh, of course, the teacher, the master, the reprobate himself, Dr. Luth. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Dr. Luth is not here. Uh, I can't wait for him to come back and join us, guys. That book will be available here soon. Fingers crossed. Of course, um, make sure you guys say your incantations on his behalf. And uh, don't let anyone who's a fundamentalist hear you. Dr. Robert McNair Price is with us at this moment, and I want to go ahead and just pass the mic to him because we have some interesting things to discuss, don't we, Dr. Bob? Oh, yeah, you bet. <laughs> yes, I am. Uh, I've been talking with you about – now, what was the first thing we were going to talk about? Because I've been talking to you about Joseph a lot lately. Uh, yeah, I've, we're uh, – putting together based on some ideas of yours and of mine, uh, an article called, uh, I forget the order of the names now, but it's something like uh, Joseph, Jesus, and Osiris. And the premise is that there are, there have long been noticed striking parallels between Jesus and uh, Joseph in the book of Genesis, uh, like that, uh, he has, a, as a child, he has a, a dream where he is represented as the uh, the sun, I guess, and, and all of his family are uh, subordinate planets. Uh, this kind of uh, coincides with uh, the, the star heralding the birth of Jesus, though, of course, there's plenty of things like that with astronomical phenomena marking either the birth or death or both of various figures like Julius Caesar. So that in itself wouldn't be that powerful, but it, that's only the beginning because you have these predictions that Joseph and Jesus will rule everybody else, and it seems kind of unlikely uh, at the time, you have the uh, the chafing of Jesus teaching on his disciples who are ostensibly followers, and there are 12 of them. And with Joseph, of course, he is the 12th, but that's, that's really not that much of a difference. It's just a kind of a variant. Uh, he's one of 12 brothers, sons of, uh, of uh, Jacob, and they get pretty sick of him. And so they decide to do him in, and they don't actually kill him, but they say, but they, they do pull off the hoax that he's dead uh, and they they say to their father gee i uh, wish the kid hadn't come out to the field where we were because uh, uh, a cougar or whatever it was uh, got him and uh, ripped the poor brat to, to shreds and here's his um his many colored coat with <laughs> with blood on it to to prove it and this seems to uh obviously be much like uh, one of the disciples, the Judas, the betrayer, uh, uh, brokering Jesus' arrest and death, and the others not making much of a sterling example of trying to save him, though some make an abortive attempt. And uh, then he is, but they throw him into a pit and they figure, well, I think, uh, is it uh, Reuben or Judah? One of them says, well, I'm going to go back and get him out of this eventually. I don't want him to die. Uh, and uh, when he gets there, he's gone because it turns out that <clears throat> the uh, wandering slave traders in one version, the Midianites and the other, the uh, Ishmaelites, uh, they have seen him and said, well, look, this is just, you know, finders keepers. Let's uh, sell this kid as a slave. But in another version, the brothers make the transaction. And when these guys happen upon him, they say, hey, how'd you like this kid as a slave? We're, we want to get rid of him. Uh, but the pit itself is certainly reminiscent of the tomb of Jesus. And finding it empty even is is another little wrinkle that they have in common. So it, he's like, he's dead symbolically, but he's brought out of the uh, the pit or the tomb, which is kind of interesting, uh, sort of Jesus-like. And when he's in the, uh, 
oh yeah sorry then he he comes to be some sort of a steward or servant of the egyptian nobleman potiphar and uh then he gets um uh, fingered by uh, somebody in the Me Too movement uh, who falsely accuses him of rape because uh, she's trying to seduce him and he'll have, have nothing to do with it. And uh, so she accuses him and of rape or attempted rape. And so he uh, gets tossed into prison, which again is sort of like the, uh, Im the uh, imprisonment of Jesus in Sheol because uh, in Acts 2, Peter says that uh, the the pangs of death couldn't hold him, and he seems to be, I think there's some linguistic pun involved, implying that the chains of death couldn't hold him in imprisonment. Well, he uh, meets two people there uh, consigned to jail, former servants of, uh, of Potiphar, is it, or am I mixing it up? Uh, one of them is a cup bearer. One is a both work uh, for the pharaoh. <clears throat> both of them worked in the house of pharaoh, from what I oh, recall. Okay. And that might be one version, but yeah. No, I think you're right. Yeah, uh, they just happen to be thrown into the same prison. Yeah, and they come to understand Jesus. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Joseph's uh, oracular powers, and he makes a prediction about each one of them. Uh, one is going to be delivered from jail and restored to his position. The other one, oops, sorry, uh, is going to get executed. This seems kind of like the, the uh, story of the crucifixion, where one of the, the two thieves is um, um, mocking Jesus and the other one isn't and says, uh, remember me when you come into your kingdom or when you come to power, basically. That, by the way, is itself a quote from a story by Diodorus Siculus in the, the second century, the same century in which uh, Luke was probably written. And uh, so it's the same idea. Of the, and then, they, um, then, then Joseph is released because the Pharaoh is in need of somebody to interpret a predictive dream. And uh, so then Joseph comes out of, of, of the jail and uh, has a meeting with Pharaoh more or less uh, corresponding to Jesus and Pilate. And uh, there is uh, the, a wife involved, though she slipped down the chain a bit, uh, from, from the accuser, Potiphar's wife. She becomes um, uh, the uh, wife of Pilate, who was in legend called... Uh, Procula. And uh, so in this one, she intervenes when Jesus is about to be crucified. She says, uh, hey, no, hands off this guy. I've had, what, a dream, right? That theme comes into it again, uh, in which I suffer greatly, which many in the early church took to mean quite reasonably that she is uh, dreaming of a future in which she will become a Christian and be martyred for it. Although it could just mean she's tossing and turning in the grip of a nightmare. Either would make sense. But but this dream in Matthew causes Pilate to uh, suddenly change his tune, and he starts trying desperately to get Jesus off the hook. Well, there's no way that would have happened historically. But if it's a retelling of a story in which it did make sense, uh, that would kind of help explain it. And because it's the the interpretation of an oracular dream that uh, causes the Pharaoh to uh, not only keep Joseph out of jail, but to make him his right hand man, his grand vizier, where he says, look, uh, you, you obviously have supernatural wisdom. Uh, I, I'm going to put you in charge. I'll just be the figurehead and all that. Uh, and uh, whatever you say, it's okay by me. And the, but he's, uh, he's alarmed because of the content of the dream. <clears throat> There's these, uh, seven cows that uh, dry up and are and skeletons, and then there's uh, seven nice, fat, healthy cows. And uh, what on earth is the meaning of this? And he says, well, they symbolize coming years of your reign. There'll be seven, well, I got them mixed up in order. There'll be the um, 
the seven prosperous years where the grain harvest will be great. Uh, and in ancient Egypt, the pharaoh owned all the land. Uh, nobody had any private property. They just kind of rented it from the state. And so the pharaoh can decide what to do with it. And he says the, the, the skinny cows are um, representing uh, seven years of famine to follow. Uh, and he says, uh, if you want my opinion, what you ought to do, uh, well, being forewarned is forearmed, right? You you should uh, uh, harvest, you should collect all the, the surplus grain from the first seven years and stockpile it so you can dole it out to your subjects when things get rough. And he says, it's a great idea. I'm, I'm putting you in charge. And so he does it. And, uh, and what he... Uh, does saves not only Egypt, but the known world at the time. Everybody is coming in from all sorts of uh, adjacent countries, like Jacob from Israel, uh, and uh, to, to get the, the, uh, the, the handouts or to buy it, I guess. And let's see, involved with this, we have other Jesus parallels because there is a scene where G, where Joseph kind of is equivalent to rising from the dead because his brothers figure oh, this kid's long dead uh, and not that they minded. And they have dealings with Joseph to get their share of the grain and he's kind of playing with them, cat and mouse, making it tough for him. But eventually when they're uh, in front of him he at a banqueting table and they wonder what's going on, he says, I might look familiar to you. You might remember me. Remember, my name's Joe. And they're all shocked and horrified. They figure karma's catching up with them. Uh, now they're going to face the music. And, and he says, look, look, don't worry. Uh, I know you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And it's issued in the salvation of everybody. Uh, you got nothing to worry about from me. Uh, and... Um, this is, of course, like the reunion of Jesus and the disciples in the Gospels and, and Jesus' conspicuous forgiveness of the one who denied him. Same sort of thing. Uh, then uh, when Jacob comes in uh, with his family, there is <clears throat> young Benjamin who has replaced Joseph as in his father's esteem. It's like God has given him a replacement because Joseph was his favorite son. He's gone. Well, in the latter days, surprise, uh, his wife bears him another son. It's Benjamin. And they say, well, it's as if I never lost him. This gets over into a parallel in um, uh, the Osiris mythology, but first, uh, what did they, what did ancient readers make of this, Christian readers anyway? They said, well, it, it had, the, the story had a meaning in uh, Jewish literature, especially in the diaspora, because Joseph was um, pictured as a good, faithful Jew who will not compromise uh, even when he's in a foreign land. And in, in actuality, they're probably thinking of either Ptolemaic Egypt or <clears throat> Babylon or some such place. And, and this is exactly the same as in the equivalent stories of Daniel uh, and uh, Esther, uh, who are Jews in, and, and the three young men, uh, Mish, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel 2, they, they advance in the foreign country under the foreign government, not by assimilating, but by refusing to, because it displays the strengths of the Jewish lifestyle. And of course, the point of this is readers don't yield to the temptation to worship the gods of the people around you and eat the unclean food they eat and all that. No, you've, don't stop circumcising your kids. Don't stop uh, keeping the Sabbath, which a lot of non-Jews thought was just institutionalized laziness. No, no, you got to keep that up. And, uh, and you'll see this is the, the best policy. Your distinctiveness will do the trick. And in fact, it did, because that's where we got the, uh, the so-called God-fearers or pious Gentiles in the, in, in the surrounding world. They 
saw Jews and, and heard what they believed, and they decided, boy, this God of theirs sounds a lot better than the crummy deities we're stuck with. I mean, Zeus and Apollo, these guys are rapists, uh, and uh, they they uh, betray one another and all this. Uh, the the God of, of Judaism is, is certainly better. Now, you might say, well, is he really? Because look at all the genocides and so on. But that's not what they were majoring on. I mean, they, they didn't preach on that, in, no doubt, in synagogue. Uh, visitors who were non-Jews said, hey, this ethical monotheism sounds pretty good. Uh, let's attend here. I don't really want to convert totally, but let's, uh, as long as they let us, let's go to the synagogue, hear their scriptures read and so on. Well, so they were right. I mean, this did work uh, and uh, for hundreds of years. But in Christianity, they didn't really care about that. That was not exactly their situation anyway. But you know what the significance in their eyes was. It was typology, that this was the, the story, the events, they would say, of Joseph's life uh, were acted prophecies. They all happened, uh, but they were for a later generation uh, who would recognize in the story of Jesus and the Gospels parallel events, as, as they thought, all historical. And uh, so it's like a prophecy of Jesus fulfilled. I have to admit the logic of that escapes me. Uh, I'm not sure how the similarity to Joseph would uh, would really make any difference to them, uh, unless, of course, you're talking about Galilean Christians who had no interest in uh, a Davidic Messiah because their own ancestors, uh, the Samaritans among them, but northern Israel generally, they had long since reputed any connection to the dynasty of David uh, after that whole business with Solomon's death and then Rehoboam and Jeroboam, the division of the kingdom. Well, it's a little hard to believe that uh, northern Israelite uh, Jews would care much. Hey, Jesus of Nazareth, he's the, uh, the, the son of David. Yeah, who needs him? Uh, but if he was like Joseph, who in the Joseph story is obviously being uh, narratively groomed to be the great prince of the northern kingdom, mm -hmm. and uh, centuries later we start hearing of a Messiah ben Joseph, which could mean various things, but might well have meant that they believed there'd be a different lineage and he would be a latter-day Joseph. So um, uh, that makes some sense. But the idea that Jesus, son of David, is another Joseph, I don't know if that makes much sense. I think it's just that Christians were looking around for anything that would seem to be a precursor to uh, to Jesus. I don't know how it verifies it or auth authenticates it, but we know they did say, yeah, this is just like Joseph. It was sort of a hint. It's, in fact, it's kind of like this weird uh, view of the dying and rising gods. You know, there were two views of them among Christians. One said that uh, the devil knew from the prophets that Christ would come and he would have a divine birth. <laughs> he would die and rise from the dead. And so he said, you know, if I can get the pagans to believe this about non-existent gods of theirs, when they hear about the real thing later, they'll say, oh, I've heard that story before. It's, there's nothing to it. Well, there was an alternate <laughs> one, uh, the, the kind C.S. Lewis would later embrace, but it was, I think Chrysostom may have held this, that, um, that these stories were expressions of a longing innate in everybody for the coming savior of whom they had no conscious knowledge, but it was like woven into the human psyche somehow. They knew they needed a savior and that he must die and rise from the dead. And so <laughs> myth became fact, as C.S. Lewis said. There, mm -hmm. were, there were no uh, dying and rising gods in the myths there were, but they never actually existed. But it shows the longing of the human and heart for the one who did, you know, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. It's and, interesting uh, how people can come up with such ideas. I mean, like just throwing this out there, you know how they talk about the God gene. Science is saying that we kind of have this innate, uh, inherent drive for something superstitious beyond us that we naturally draw to. 
uh, it sounds like something that he is is tapping into in a way, very superstitious in, uh, approach, but by suggesting that the reason all these stories look like it is because truly there was supposed to be the true one. And uh, I feel bad mm. for the guys who really fell for the wrong thing then. That sucks for them, right? I mean, goodness gracious. Yeah, this would be like uh, the pagan um, prophetess or Sybil or whatever in uh, Acts 16 uh, when Paul and uh, Barnabas, I guess, uh, show up in Philippi or is it Silas? Uh, yeah, Paul and Silas, yeah. Uh, they, this woman who is a slave and uh, tells fortunes Lydia, she, well, no, I think it's supposed to be Lydia. It doesn't actually say. She comes in a little later. Uh, she's saying, hey, everybody, listen to these guys because they're telling you the true way of salvation. And then Paul shuts her up uh, for some reason. Uh, but Luke, why has Luke recorded it? Well, for a couple of reasons, I think. If you read my book, uh, The Widow Traditions in Luke Acts, it's because as a second century ecclesiastic luke is trying to silence women's prophecy but originally the before he got to it the idea was it's just like in one of the pastoral epistles as even one of their own poets has said a so and so it's like look you don't believe me even a pagan has said this right. uh, so you ought to listen i think that's that was kind of the point uh, and uh or like Virgil saying that uh, a child will uh, lead them. That was similar to, uh, I think, something in Isaiah. And, and there's sort of a point to this. It's it's like uh, the law of biographical analogy or structuralism in myth that in different places, different people with the same basic equipment upstairs wrestle with a range of similar problems and right. inevitably come up with a range of similar answers. So it's not that odd, but they <sighs> they couldn't help see it from their standpoint. They wanted Christianity to be unique. And uh, so they, uh, th this was the uh, the theory. And to, to me, the Jos the idea that Joseph prefigured Jesus is sort of like that. It's like saying, well, it was already being uh, uh, broadcast at least to the people of Israel, though they couldn't quite have understood it at the time. But in retrospect, and that's often what New Testament claims of prophecy mean, like in Matthew, uh, the, how did he know uh, Jesus and his family went to Israel, to uh, Egypt and came back? Uh, he quotes Hosea 11.1, 1, out of Egypt I have called my son. Well, he wasn't an illiterate fool. The guy was the greatest scholar of the New Testament as a, uh, whoever he was, he was trained in uh, rabbinic lore and, and Christian teaching too. And he knew it meant the, the my son coming out of Egypt had to do with the exodus of the Israelites right. from Egypt. He knew that. What, what he's doing is like what the Qumran sect did uh, and say that, yeah, yeah, we know what it said. Uh, but uh, now a new hidden meaning Meaning has been been revealed to us, right. and uh, and so on. Well, that's what they're doing. They're, they're not like the the con men and idiots that some critics make them. Like, oh, he's just taking it out of context. These boobs will never be able to read their own copy anyway. They don't have them, so let's just tell them the Bible says this. Like the no, old they joke. really believed in their own secret. Like like we talked about, there's perceptions. There's different perceptions we mm -hmm. can put on this. You could say, well, the reason why there's so many similarities is because really inherently the divine within us is all trying to reach out, but this one's the real one. Or you could say, Hey, maybe there's some type of uh, if you want to be scientific and natural about it, maybe there's something in the brain that causes us all to somehow try to fill in the missing link, so to speak, in not understanding things. And so we superimpose a supernatural or metaphysical explanation. Maybe there is one, maybe there isn't one. And we kind of do that. So there's always perceptions to look at. But Dr. Bob, I want to take you back real quick for a second, because you said some interesting things. Talking about Joseph. This is the logic I'm getting. And there's perceptions you can look at this once again and get lost in a variety of different ways of trying to maybe perceive this. But it seems to me when you find the parallels, when you see the foreshadow uh, come into fruition, and you look at the story of Joseph, and then you look at Jesus, and it's a rewrite. It really is. There's very few things that are changed um, purposefully, in my opinion, mo more parallels than not. 
yeah. Um, yeah. In, in, in like almost in the same exact sense, other than maybe like the wife didn't try to sleep with Joseph. Uh, instead, here he had a dream. She had a dream. And so there's different ways in which the New Testament author places these things. Do you think the re- revelation of him revealing his circumcision to his brothers in that uh, at that dinner table? And I, and I, I kind of want to mention that because here we have the Last Supper taking place so to speak. Ah, And you ah. have the revelation of here's my circumcision. Now here's the interesting thing. We know Paul talks about the circumcision of heart, which the new Testament author has a different angle. They're trying to take that. But um, if you take the circumcision that Joseph finally reveals his true identity to them, that circumcision is the Thomas fill of my hands, fill of my side revelation to the disciples, but particularly to one, the twin, Thomas. And notice the twin of Joseph is the one that comes in as the replacement of Jesus. Here, there's similarities. They're not identical, but Thomas is being revealed, the the hands and, and, you know, fill the wounds. And that's how he knew, oh, it is you, Lord. Oh, there's a replication. And here's the problem. Here's what I, all this to get to the point I'm trying to make. And anytime, you know, you can call me. I've got a lot more that came to mind when we talked about these parallels. I don't want to bog down the show with because there's a lot more, I think, here. Once you see that, once you recognize and the light bulb goes off, like the, like the background behind me, just, okay. By the way, if you haven't gone to robertinprice.mindvinner.com, you better do so now or we will find you. Anyway, back to the story. <laughs> In light of this, Dr. Bart Ehrman, and I have the recording, I, I, I'll put it down in the description for anybody watching, a good friend of mine, Greg, actually sent this to me. Dr. Bart Ehrman said that a guy named Jesus, he believed, actually predicted the fall of the Jerusalem temple. And he was debating a Christian, and you thought there would be like, all right, here's where we're splitting hairs. And they said, well, here we're going to probably have a difference of opinion. The temple's destruction is predicted. And, um, and Jesus predicts it because the Gospels were written before, according to the Christian. Bart agrees. Eh, the Gospels could have been written before. I actually do believe that there was a guy who was a Messianic figure who actually did predict, predict the fall of Jerusalem. When you see these parallels, all right, and that's a crazy statement coming from Bart, in my opinion, to that's suppose. surprising, yeah. He accepts what the text says at face value far more, in my opinion, then when we're doing all this back work, all in the background, and seeing the threaded nature of this text being parallels and, and retellings and images that are just being copies of this and like in different ways, where is, this, where is this trust that you can have in this text to say, there was a guy named Jesus really predicting the fall of Jerusalem? Where do you find that? Well, I think that uh, one possible argument is that Jesus must well the argument from embarrassment that if he if he uh, did predict this and it didn't happen then they could hardly have made it up because even though the temple destruction happened the uh, ensuing end of the world did not and uh, if that's all one package as it looks like the gospel writers are trying to make it Bart might say, well, they never would have made up such a thing in light of what actually happened or didn't. So maybe he did. But um, there are other possibilities. Uh, Timothy Colani, a Roman Catholic priest in the 19th century, said, uh, I have a hunch that uh, the the original Mark and Apocalypse simply had Jesus answer the disciples' question, when will the temple be destroyed? I mean, that's what they ask him. Mm-hmm. And that uh, that the apocalypse itself, most of chapter 13, was interpolated from what Eusebius tells us was a Christian pamphlet circulated just before the when they could see that Jerusalem was under siege and it was about to to be destroyed and that's why it says when you see this uh get the heck out run for the hills that right. it, you could see it coming and that somebody made this apocalyptic track to warn everybody 
Well, Kalani said that that got uh, stitched into it at some point, but that originally Jesus' answer to their question, when will these things be, is no one knows the day or the hour. Uh, and uh, that the, the whole thing, which seems to contradict that, I mean, he's telling you step right. by step what you can say. So originally that may not even have been in the gospel. I'm not saying, oh, that's probably true. There's just no way to know. Uh, but then you can't dogmatize about the opposite either. How can you make a statement like that as a scholar, though, like what he's saying? It just to me, it's like, he, I, dude, I can play the clip. If I need to pull it up, I'll play it up and share the screen and show our audience. He said Jesus that he believes was a real guy according to the Gospels. Now, we're not even talking about Paul yet, okay? Mm-hmm. We're literally talking about the, go- the fictional, historical, fictional accounts, Gospels. He trusts, and I don't know for what reason— that this guy came along and says, hey, not one stone will be left upon another unless he thinks that was embellished, but he really was predicting the destruction of this thing. I think there were many people who had a hunch that it was going to be attacked. But in my opinion, I doubt anyone went around really firmly saying, look, this whole damn thing is going to fall. You, you, it was so big and enormous and probably uh, something they thought would never happen. Why would they go about doing that? What's more likely? And this is where I come in, in my opinion. They wrote it after it already fell. (laughs) I mean, to say a man knew that this was going to happen or predicted it would, the only way I could accept that is if there were pre-70 AD writings that we can prove as a matter of fact of other sources, of other people who claimed that that temple was going to fall, not after, before, that that temple was going to fall. If you can prove to me that there were sources prior to this temple's destruction, then I could say maybe, and it's still a huge maybe, that they may have taken that source from them and said, hey, this guy this said the damn thing was going to fall. Let's add that to our mess- messianic figure. There's no telling where this information comes yeah. from. He so comfortably accepts what's written there. That's his approach. And I told Greg, my buddy, I said, look, that's the sad part. I think that historicist approach the text just accepting what it's saying somewhat and have this faith in what the authors are saying is actually historically accurate. And that's, a, that's too much faith in the text, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. You, you have to make the text justify itself. That's a major uh, axiom of historical research. You don't just believe it until you have reason not to. Uh, and th- that notion is sort of a, a vestige of the old scissors and paste chronicler view that you you uh, you weren't there. You don't have a time machine. So all your uh, documentation is precious. So you'd like to be able to have have knowledge, not to be ignorant of the past, and so you give the benefit of the doubt until to, to any source, and you harmonize them uh, until you can't, and then you have to say, well, okay, I guess this one is not like in in I forget which is which, but in one of the either first or second Maccabees, it says that. Um, Antiochus Epiphanes sacked Egypt, but in the other one, it says that uh, there was a line drawn in the sand, and he decided not to go into Egypt. Well, which one was it? Well, there you you've kind of got to decide. But uh, this is this wanting to give it the the uh, benefit of the doubt is, is a problem. But what you mention um, bears on the whole Josephus thing because. Josephus, though he is writing uh, 30 to 40 years after the fall of Jerusalem, he records uh, that uh, whether it's true or not, who knows, but he tells about a, a prophet deemed sort of a madman who just walked around the, the city before the uh, the fall of it and the siege. His name was Jesus, Jesus mm-hmm. ben Ananias. And he was saying that uh, the woe to the city, woe to the temple, etc. And people tried to shut him up and they even brought him to the Roman procurator and said, can't you do something about this guy? And so he questioned him and he would say nothing in his own defense, which may sound sort of familiar. And uh, then the, uh, the procurator says to him, where are you from? which is just what Jesus has asked, and he, he says nothing. Uh, so they flog him uh, and then let him go. 
but he continues as before. And some uh, years later, when the Roman siege is underway, he's uh, preaching from the top of the city wall that, you know, your doom is upon you. He says, woe to the city, woe to the temple, and woe unto me. And he's killed by a, a catapult. Uh, yeah. missile. Uh, and this is, I mean, if that's correct, that is an earlier version, but it almost doesn't matter. It cuts, the sword cuts both ways. Thank you. It implies as, um, as uh, my Jesus Seminar colleague, uh, whose name I'm going to blank out on because I'm senile, uh, <laughs> It's the guy that wrote uh, Mark Traditions, and Theodore J. Whedon. He wrote this astonishing um, book, The Two Jesuses, where he takes up a suggestion of mine, actually, that the passion narrative was borrowed from this in Josephus. And he, he does a much better job than I did and points out loads of parallels that I had even missed. Well, it, it implies that the, the whole nucleus of the passion narrative is taken from Josephus. And uh, right. so uh, there's, it's under, well, also you had Jeremiah in the Old Testament who was thrown down a well uh, for saying that eh, the Babylonians are on their way and God is not going to save you. Uh, the the temple the city will be destroyed. And they said, "You a traitor!" And they threw him down this well. Uh, and so, uh, who knows what what right. uh, this stuff is based on? And uh, but that is another important uh, thing where Josephus is involved, though in a different way. Let me ask you um, this on that real quick before I lose my my track of thought. If if Josephus is recording this Jesus character that may have taken years prior. I don't know if he specifies in his writings, but regardless, if this is the Jesus and it looks like it's definitely being borrowed from, could there be, I mean, there's a couple ways to look at this, but could it be that it's obvious that, like you said, it's a double-edged sword because if this is him, how is he under the Roman procreator in the 30s, Pontius Pilate? And if he's all the way back in the 30s, doing supposedly this that he's flogged according to the gospels how is he at 60 something ad doing the same thing during the war on the top of the temple if this is the jesus that 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 seems a little weird can it actually be both and then another thing is it's apparently obvious that you can't deny the, the parallels to joseph okay this copying back could josephus be copying joseph this is where we start to get into something else too well, because of his name, perhaps, uh, because like um, Joseph becomes the grand vizier of the Egyptian pharaoh, uh, Josephus becomes a counselor to the Roman emperor because of something he said that involved prediction. You mm -hmm. know, uh, you may not know this, uh, your majesty, but you're predicted in the book of Numbers. Uh, you're the Messiah of Israel. And then... Uh, uh, Johann and Ben Sakai says the same thing. Uh, I mean, totally opposite to, from Josephus. He's uh, he's no collaborator and so on. But uh, you have to wonder where if you toss the coin and it's rolling around, where is it going to rest? What's the prototype? Is it Joseph? Is it Josephus? Uh, he may have done the same sort of thing, or he may have placed himself into the narrative as Joseph of Arimathea, which is almost the same name, jo Joseph Bar Matthias, uh, and uh, and so and that would that would uh, fit the business about three men crucified, one survives, because there's the story in Josephus's autobiography that once he was in good with Titus, he happened to notice among the many Jewish rebels crucified that there were uh, three people he knew. And he went to Titus and said, I know these guys, could I have a special dispensation and you, you rescue them? Because people were sometimes rescued from the cross. Right. And, uh, and so he says, yeah, sure or why not? And he directs somebody or other to take him down. Two of them are too far gone and they expire. One of them is in better health and lives. Well, you wonder why in the gospel, Jesus is crucified with these two others and, and um, he, he is crucified as a criminal too, 
But Joseph of Arimathea asks for only one of the bodies, that is, of Jesus. Is that supposed to be the same sort of thing? Joseph of Arimathea is Joseph Bar Matthias, and instead of saving only one, well, he doesn't know he's doing that, but he takes him down and uh, and he he comes back to life. I also think there was an earlier version of the gospel story in which Jesus didn't die, but was thought to have died and was rescued in time early mm -hmm. from the cross. Well, I'm not saying that's what I think happened. I'm just saying that was another version of the story that right. survives in various hints even now. Well, um, we need to check those out sometime. <laughs> mm. For sure. Uh, and uh, so, the whole that whole part of it might reflect. Uh, Josephus's own experience and would sort of give a kind of solution to the puzzle in the Gospels. Why is he only interested in Jesus? Josephus wasn't, but only one of them lived. Um, so that's Joseph, and also the thing when he's a whiz kid and he's uh, 12 or 13 year old, years old and in the temple confounding all of the, the big wigs who, uh, uh, is, I always wondered about this thing, what the heck does it mean not to see the kid in its mother's milk? Oh, I'll tell you that, uh, Hezekiah means this. Um, that pops up again in, in the Gospel <laughs> of Luke, also a second century work. And uh, you've uh, and the references to Theudas and uh, and uh, uh, Judas of Galilee, which scholars tend to re recognize now as they once did, that comes from Josephus. It looks like Jose Josephus is basing either others are basing gospel stories on writings of Josephus. Or if he himself did this, is he doing what an still another Joseph, Joseph Smith, just by accident, did in the Book of Mormon, where he said he has some prophets say that there'll be a great prophet who will eventually come, and he'll have the same name as Joseph, uh, uh, Jacob's son, and uh, and so and so will uh, reveal a set of brass tablets, uh, but most people won't listen to him, but some will. And he's like inserting himself into the story by saying, you know, this sounds a lot like uh, uh, Joseph Smith, our prophet. Oh, yeah, what a surprise. Uh, and uh, and then, oh, the other thing here uh, that that's a key piece of this, whatever it turns out to be, is that Joseph is already a Hebrew retelling of the story of Osiris. Right. Uh, he is betrayed by his brother, Set, uh, and uh, because um, Osiris is the god of grain and Set is the god of the desert, and so he conspires to kill him and take his place because the seasons replacing one another in sequence. And so he, he uh, at a party or a supper, has uh, he sets up this this beautiful sarcophagus and oh where'd this come from? Uh, uh, I bet any of you would like to be buried in this in style. I know I would. Uh, tell you what, we'll just give it as the door prize to anybody who best fits it. Let let's try. I form a line over there, and they do. But it's like the glass slipper with Cinderella. Uh, none of them fit except for Joseph, the last one to try it. And of course, it was for his measurements. They his sets goons run over and nail the thing shut and then send it uh, drifting on the river. Uh, Osiris and Nephthys, sisters of, of each other and of uh, Osiris, also brides of his, they seek out the, the body. I guess they think he might still be alive. Let's see. And they do eventually find it. Uh, but and then uh, it gets their different versions of this. But when they do, they uh, uh, said again, I guess, chops the body into pieces. And uh, but um, Isis anoints them with some kind of magical oil and rejoins the pieces, kind of like Frankenstein. Right. And uh, and this raises them from the dead. Well, uh, that's kind of like, uh, well, let's just say, henceforth, uh, he impregnates uh, Isis on the spot, 
and then goes off to sit in judgment in the nether world, which was their heaven. It was just down instead of up. Amente. He he judges the dead, and uh, and then he he has begotten Horus, the sun falcon, who uh, takes vengeance on Set. And Horus is uh, like Benjamin. He's the replacement for the favorite son, continuing on Earth. And uh, uh, while uh, while uh, Osiris reigns as as almost a king, as uh, as um, uh, Joseph does, and so there are clear parallels t to this. In fact, the chopping up, the dismemberment of of his body is reflected in the story of Joseph with the the multicolored. Uh, coat or tunic or whatever it is, uh, when they rip it up, I, I at least always imagine it's made of different colored strips of cloth sewn together, and that they just ripped it at the seams and said, here's all that's left of uh, Joe. Uh, and that that's uh, equivalent of the, the dismembering of Osiris. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's there's those parallels. And then finally, there are parallels between Osiris and Jesus. And of course, everybody knew about Osiris in New Testament times, the cult of Iris and or, I'm sorry, Isis and or, Isis and Osiris or Serapis, who was a kind of a tinkered version of Osiris. Uh, their religion spread from Hellenistic Egypt all over the Mediterranean. It was a huge religion. Anybody would have known about this. And of course, he was a dying and rising God, and he had a sacrament of bread and beer, or bread and wine, because he was the God of the grape and the uh, and the grain and uh, he's betrayed by uh, his his brother and like with Jesus it's only one uh, and so on and so on so it's hard to trace the lines of dependence but it almost doesn't matter uh, there was more going on than we know and if we know that this much was going on uh, you can kind of assume that uh, that they are connected one way or another like they didn't go from Plutarch's account of Isis and Osiris and only that to Jesus there were various versions of it uh, the women seeking uh, Osiris's body and and uh, it's just like Mary Magdalene and the others seeking the body of Jesus and what are they going to do when they find it anoint it right. well uh, we know why if we think this is based on Osiris, they want to raise him from the dead, and they do, but that's been changed over to chapter 14, the Bethany anointing. Uh, and uh, so it just seems to me there are too many parallels and coincidences. Well, to look think at a couple here. Any of these things are historical. Here's a couple interesting things like you talk about with Osiris. Osiris, of course, he was cut into 14 pieces. You know, there's plenty of seven and seven, two sets of sevens over mm. and over num numerologically with Joseph and the dreams and uh, even prior to going to prison or down in the dungeon and being sold. And then, of course, after later on with Pharaoh's dream, there's two sets of seven. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and I've heard it said, oh, don't try to say, you know, a lot of historicists I've heard. Don't try and say that Jesus is like Osiris, the dying, rising God parallel. Well, if he's a copy or definitely a rewrite of an Old Testament version that obviously is, why wouldn't he be? And if we could find sets of se uh, numerological connections, some type of uh, uh, where it looks similar in terms of the story, uh, if there's some type of patterns there, that's stuff I look for. And uh, Jesus' own genealogy is three sets of 14. So mm. there's 14 that plays in one of the Gospels. I mean, of course, it's not all yeah, of them. Yeah, it's Matthew. But it's, it, it, it tells me there's this connection to the Old Testament. And if you take mm. a connection to the Old Testament, and that has a connection or some type of borrowing, uh, then it's fair to say that the authors were aware of that as well. I suspect they weren't ignorant and in, in not knowing that the other myths around them had. Oh, yeah, that's it, it can't be. Uh, because if you start saying that, oh, it's a sheer coincidence, uh, nobody feels like they can do that. So that's why they resort to the satanic counterfeit nonsense or the uh, this archetypal yearning for the real Messiah because they, they just can't say, <laughs> oh, there's this no connection here. They just have right. to do this ad hoc hypothesis. Um, <laughs> 
so I got to do more thinking on this, but I, there, it, there's got to be something to it. By the way, are you sure he um, that uh, Josephus, I'm sorry, Joseph uh, in Genesis shows his circumcised penis to yes. identify himself? Yes. What um, is that in chapter forty? Joseph reveals his circumcision to brothers. Bible verse. All right, Genesis 45, verse 3. <clears throat> um, let's look and at Joseph Genesis said 45. to his brothers, I am Joseph, is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. Hold on. I'm looking at, let me look at the verses prior and after that, because I recall him revealing, because he had to show him his circumcision so they knew it was him. Joseph could no longer control himself. Remember when he was crying, he was walking in the back. He cried out, have everyone leave me in my presence. There was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and the Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is, is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified of this presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was this, to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth. Once again, one of the same ideas, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God, he made, he made me father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household, ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Let me see where, where it's at here. Goshen near me. Okay, famine. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it is really I am speaking to you. Tell my father about the honor could have swore it talked about circumcision here i mean that would make sense yeah uh, um tell your brothers load the animals okay i'm trying to find let me google that again yeah. did, did joseph did joseph show his circumcision to his brothers all right. Uh, jo okay. Rabbi Yehuda says he approached to wage war. Okay. Nope. That's that's some other crap. <laughs> uh, so uh, when Jacob saw that there was grain, and this is in Genesis 42. Let's see. Dot on before them to their faces. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. All right, where do you come from? They said from the land of Canaan to buy food. So Joseph recognized his brother, but they did not recognize him. All right, uh, then Joseph remembered the dreams, which he had dreamed about them, talking about the bowing down. Um, let's see. This looks like Genesis 42. I want to see where, where he reveals himself to them. It's, it's, it's in here somewhere, I'm telling you, Dr. Bob. Yeah, I'll I, look too. I remember, uh, and maybe we don't have time on this program, but uh, he definitely reveals himself to his brothers. Um, where I, I need to find it clearly saying that, obviously, circumcision, because that was the mark, obviously, that they knew. And I don't know if he says he revealed the mark or something like that, rather than saying his circumcision. But it was a clear indication, I remember reading this through, where they knew it was him for certain. Um, and, uh, how the heck did they know that? Well, could that rabbinic, uh, thing they mentioned there be, uh, a speculation by some scribe saying, well, how did he reveal himself? Uh, and, uh, I don't recall reading anything about from rabbinic tradition or anything like I, I'm not well read like that. This is like, for me reading, um, reading this text, I pretty much stuck to the Bible as a fundamentalist for many years. So I will have to find it though. It was to me, it was evident that the only way he could prove he was a Hebrew was his circumcision to them because 
they weren't going to buy that this Egyptian guy was, you know, according to the tale, like they weren't going to accept that. Like, how do we know you're Joseph? You're dead. There's no way. And uh, I could have swore he reveals himself in this story somewhere. I just have to find out where, you know? Well, he does reveal his identity in some kind of convincing way. Well, I suppose uh, no one would have known about this, uh, if, who, who the heck Joseph was, if, but Joseph. Right. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, I want to do some hunting here, too, because isn't there, there's a similar thing in Exodus where Moses is kind of depicted as another Joseph because he's a persecuted Israelite who winds up being in the royal house, albeit by a different uh, stratagem. And uh, there's this thing about how um, Pharaoh's daughter knows that uh, the, the baby in the picnic basket there is a um, – uh, is she says this is one of the Hebrew? Yeah, this in Exodus two, five and six. Uh, now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to fetch it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and lo, the babe was crying. She took pity on him and said, "This is one of the Hebrews' children." Mm. Um, and so, well, how would she have known that? In the movie, The Ten Commandments, they imply that, I think, that it was because of the cloth uh, that he was wrapped in. But uh, I always assumed it was that he was circumcised, that uh, she, she would have seen that immediately and said, oh, oh the kid's Jewish. Uh, right. And, um, but so it may have been the same thing. It might be implicit in that. And I wonder if if some uh, rabbi pointed that out, and just because often their uh, their midrash on the text was to expand it by trying to figure out what's implicit in it. Uh, okay. Well, something must have caused this. What was it? Yeah, because uh, there's right here a website stackexchange.com where the guy says, "How did Yosef?" Of course, they spell him Yosef. Uh, how did Yosef showing his circumcision prove anything? So this he's using Rashi to 45 verse 4. So obviously, Okay, well, I bet you it's there. He says, uh, says that when Yosef told his brothers to approach him, it was to show them his circumcision, presumably to prove he was Jewish. But how would that prove anything? All of Egypt had been circumcised already, as Rashi says on 41 verse 55. If his showing his circumcision wasn't to prove he was Jewish, why did he do it? And then, of course, they go into an explanation because I do know that the the Egyptians used to circumcise as well. It wasn't yeah, a Hebrew thing. But from what I from what I recall, and I could be mistaken here. I mean, but I, if you're watching this and you have insight, uh, comment down below on uh, where you know that Joseph, and it may not even be implicit in here, but it might be somewhere within the story of Joseph. Uh, where he reveals the circumcision, because I think that is a that is a revelation he reveals to people who didn't mm. think it was probably him, uh, the same way that Thomas did not necessarily believe uh, mm. Jesus, and it's the same thing. So when you see the same stuff like that, I think, and this is just a rule of thumb: agree or disagree, Doctor Bob. Once you see something like that repeat itself or look so similar, really need to question its authenticity historically. You need yeah. to say, okay, did really a guy named Thomas experience something like that? Or, well, Bart Ehrman seems to take an approach that goes, yes, like this is, and I might be throwing too much in, but it seems to me he would say, yes, there was a room full of disciples, including a guy named Thomas, who really believed that they actually saw the risen Lord and actually felt and ate with an actual guy, but it was all trippy in their mind. To me, it's more plausible, even though, yes, people trip out today and, yes, people see things, but 12 guys seeing a dancing pink elephant to me seems unlikely. It would be my assumption this is legend and written after, and I would start with a literary approach different than the approach he's taking on the text, and that is the approach I think mythicists do different. And I'm not talking about all mythicists, even though I think most do. I'm talking about the scholarly approach of mythicism even, okay? You guys take a different approach. You see all the webbings in the background, and you see a huge red flag, and you start with, let's see what's, what's after testing and seeing these things, what really stands the test at the end? 
They start with, yep, there was a guy named Joseph. Yep, there was a guy named Jesus. Yes, he was crucified. Yes, he rose from the dead, but they're all tripping. Let's try and think naturally here. Uh, most likely they were just having cognitive dissonance and they all just wanted to believe in a Messiah. I think there's more of a literary approach, but I could be wrong. I'm just throwing it out there. What well, do you th I think uh, another way of saying that, and it's a good insight, is that uh, you got to apply Occam's razor uh, you have the the uh, idea that one text has influenced another, that B is a rewrite of A, and that adequately explains what's in B. Uh, that seems to be pretty simple and not implausible. But if you throw in, well, uh, there was uh, a real person here, uh, and uh, his his story has been embellished somewhat. That's really a, a fifth wheel. That's a superfluous pseudo explanation. And you see this, I think, in, in Bart's work when, uh, like in Did Jesus Exist? He says that um, if you take away, he says naturally, the Christian events might have been retold in terms of the Old Testament. Details might have been borrowed uh, and so on when, when there was a broader similarity, but not one that demands a literary origin it may have been embellished. Well, uh, my response was take away all the parallels and bracket them off as uh, embellishments. What the heck is left? Right. I mean, like uh, Jesus raising the son. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, Jesus raising the son of the widow of Nain. It's just like Elijah raising the son of the widow of Zarephath, and so on. It, it, I mean, look at the parallels there. If you take those away, you've got no story. And that's you know, actually what, was, what you did in your debate. What yeah. you did in your debate, if anybody goes back and watches it, I think it's worthy of another view. I'm going to watch it again myself sometime soon. I, I learn something new every time I watch it. But you did the same thing in the debate. You mentioned, you know, once you strip away these things, Dr. Bob, it's like, uh, tell me what is going to be valuable enough to mention and you make that point. You're like, okay, so these pigs come running down the hill into the water. Where's the value in that? Like, tell me why this is even, if this is embellished, this is legend, remove it. What's left? Pigs running yeah. down into the water? That might be legend too. So where do you draw the line and how do you know? That's the question when historicity comes on the scene and they say, matter of fact, we know for fact Jesus existed. At least say he may have. Yeah. And and yeah. he may have been this person or it's plausible that he may have existed and here's why. Okay. Knowing as matter of fact is a scary place in my opinion. I, I don't know. That's just my opinion. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, ladies uh. and gentlemen, thank you for joining us here at Myth Vision. Dr. Bob, once again, we've got to continue this. Um mm. I um I would reveal who I really am to you right now, but I'm a, I'm afraid that <laughs> That would be taken the wrong way. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm just going to say that, fill my hands. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, right. Let's just stick with the, the New Testament version. And uh, yeah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God almighty. Um, well, do you have any closing words you'd like to say before I close this out? Well, this just shows both the, uh, the promise and the disappointment of biblical studies. There's such a, a, so many riches of possibility. It's like uh, uh, an overchoice situation. Uh, and, and it's like, oh man, all these things to consider. And yet there are so many, it seems like there's no way to do anything but speculate. In the introduction to our forthcoming great book, uh, Varieties of Jesus Mythicism, which is really going to be terrific because I've read all but one of the essays, which I've not received yet. Uh, it deals with the Roman providence thing, with astrotheology, with dying and rising God myths. and It's just great. Um, I say in the introduction, that we that mythicists often point out that mainstream scholars who believe there was a historical Jesus come nowhere near agreeing on what he was like. Was he a, a proto-feminist? Was he a revolutionist? Was he a community organizer, a magician, a Hasid, et cetera, et cetera? 
Uh, I said, well, uh, the prospect is no better if you're a mythicist, because here are all of these rival theories which have some plausibility and we can never know. So in a way, it's not really an advance. You haven't just cleared out, you haven't cleared the ground for the the one uh, prize winner. There's there's no way to tell. Uh, We're just as bound to undecidable speculation as as any historicist is and that's fair that's yep. fair i'm okay with that that's why i'm a skeptic i just remain yep. a skeptic i do mental gymnastics and um just remain flexible wherever the evidence goes For, sometimes i feel like i am a historicist dr bob i really do sometimes and then other times i have to you know check myself and go hold on Do you know what that means to all this other stuff? So how do you, you know, I can't reconcile. So um, I appreciate you joining the show. Guys, if you haven't seen the website to Dr. Bob's right here, okay, go check him out. Give him a PayPal. Join us, Patreon. He has articles that he posts there. He has plenty of books you can get through there. Go to the Amazon through the, if you go through the website, I think it helps. Don't you guys have an affiliate? Um, Yes. Okay. So go through the website to get those links uh, to check out his books. He's going to be back on the show unless he gets raptured. And I've kind of had this um, angel of the Lord whispering that to me lately. And I wasn't supposed to tell you guys, but because you're part of the inner circle, I, I'll let you know, but I can't tell you the oh, day I'm or going the hour. Up. I'm going up. <laughs> and I appreciate you joining and all the love that you give to us here at Myth Vision. I appreciate it. Love you. Derek Lambert. Thanks, Dr. Bob. Oh, thank you. And now I'm going to go have dinner.